Coming up, answering your questions, responding to your feedback, 15 different missives from you. Yes, this is as close as I get to ask me anything. I'd go so far as to call it a Q and A gasm. I'm John Cadogan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. For buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously. Or you can just click the card that's occasionally not there now, dude. Just above Uncle Darth. Now, a quick question from John Vender. Is it a good idea to let the engine run for a few minutes after a cold start before driving? The way I see this, okay, this obsession with warming cars up is typically an old dude thing. It's a beard stroking thing and it harks back at least four decades into the 80s, right? And you think about the 80s and they had interesting hair and interesting clothes and things like that, but they didn't have that interesting engines and engine technology compared with today. Today, so much better. Okay, so much better. And there are three core issues that made warming up a thing in the 80s, right? There's drivability, and then there was lubrication, and then there's metallurgy, which would be how well all the parts in the engine fit together in the context of going from dead cold to operating temperature, all right? So back in the 80s, great many cars out there on the roads had carburetors and they had sort of analog control of things like air fuel ratios and ignition timing and spark advance and valve timing and all of that stuff, right? There just wasn't the high speed digital control of the combustion process throughout the warming up period that there is today. It just, it just wasn't as good, okay? So from a drivability point of view, an engine is basically good to go the minute it catches fire, okay? It's turning and burning, it's good to go. Modern engine with direct injection and all of that stuff, it's just ready off the bat. So drivability, not an issue. Okay, let's talk about lubrication though because that's changed a bit as well and back in the 80s, like four decades ago, when we were young and attractive to women, some of us at least in our own minds through the rose-coloured glasses of retrospectivity, mineral oils, right? Not as good as today's synthetic oils and the big party trick for synthetic oils, apart from their longer life, is their ability to maintain an acceptable range of viscosity through, <clears throat> excuse me, a great range of operating temperature. Meaning from dead cold, the oil remains pretty runny and easy to pump right up into the top of the engine by the oil pump, okay? And at high temperatures, it doesn't thin out too much. It remains thick enough to do an effective job lubricating. So the viscosity range, like the acceptable range of viscosity has been extended by chemical engineering. And I'd suggest that if you crank your engine, it starts, you put your seatbelt on, you close the door or something, you check the mirrors, you get yourself situationally aware and you drive down your driveway, that engine is fully pressurized from the point of view of being good to go, okay? So lubrication also not an issue. So from that point of view, warming up's just a waste of time. And then of course there's metallurgy. Back in the 80s we had lower emission standards and there was less imperatives on car makers to get the engine up to its operating temperature quickly, which would be where it's most efficient and doesn't emit too many noxious this and that, principally unburned hydrocarbons when it's cold, right? So today we've got much better control of the process and the warm-up happens quicker, the whole thing is designed to reach its operating temperature quicker, more engine components are made of aluminium, and aluminium is a much better thermal conductor than cast iron, for example. So engines warm up quicker as well. And for all these reasons, I'd suggest in an average car, if you start, get yourself aware, just idle back out the driveway, and then drive gently for a total of 30 seconds to one minute, that's as good as warming the car up for several minutes in the 80s, okay? So you just have to adapt your mindset about this kind of thing to current technology. And obviously, it's a really, really bad idea to go and set the lap record until the engine is 
exactly at its normal operating temperature and there's like the full heat soak, okay? What I'm talking about is instead of sitting there just turning and burning to no purpose, you're better off just driving gently for a few minutes and then just drive normally and that will do just as well for you and the longevity of your engine as warming up for several minutes did in the 1970s and the 1980s. Oh man, you'll be a fossil in five years time. Three years ago, Tesla had one production factory now they have five and more rolling out across the world good luck with your combustion engines in these seemingly adversarial circumstances isn't it often nice to kick off with the things we agree on and fossilization yeah like every time i look in the mirror it confronts me i know exactly what time it is right like it's later. However, one of the most insufferable things about this transitional phase we're in now where we've got established internal combustion over here and we've got electric vehicles and hydrogen over here is the people in the different camps who treat it like a frigging religion. And one of the core tenets of religion, obviously, is faith. Like, you just have to believe, right? And one of the things you have to believe is that every other religion is wrong. And that's exactly how the dynamics work between hydrogen and electric vehicles and internal combustion and in reality, for decades to come, there is a place for all three. Now, the difference between me and some frigging EV zealot, and let's not forget... I drove an EV for 12 months, a Kona Electric, and I loved it. And I didn't miss going to a fuel station, not once, right? So I get the EV thing. They're pleasant to drive and they do a few jobs really well. And in some respects, they're better than internal combustion and in others, they're not, right? You've got to be realistic, meaning in touch with the facts, especially if you want to deal with the big problem, which is the climate emergency. Now, here in Australia, we are still approving new coal mines. We are still exporting an amount of coal equivalent to our national greenhouse onshore emissions. This is out of step with the desire of most people in the electorate and certainly most people in the developed world. There's a surge of opinion among ambient humanity that we need to solve this problem and us doing what we're doing with coal is not the solution okay nor is some sort of grandiose promise from our useless prime minister about 1.7 million evs on the road by 2030 like that's ridiculous the foundations are not in place to make that happen and at best in terms of the climate emergency it's a friggin band-aid OK, so you've got to be realistic if you want to make a change. And if you said to me, I'm going to buy an EV because I am concerned about air quality in our cities, I would go big tick, dude, that works. If you said I'm concerned about national energy security and in particular our vulnerability in terms of the supply of liquid fuels and I'm going to do my little bit by buying an EV, I'd go big tick dude because that is a strategic problem for our national security and if you do that you're taking a little bit of that burden away a little bit of that dependency on foreign oil but if you said I'm doing this because it's the only thing I see that can help the climate emergency I'd say well how about we divorce ourselves from coal and get realistic and in touch with the facts because that's the only way humanity can hope to solve any problem. Most of this car shortage hype is so manufacturers can create fear of missing out and gouge more money from you. Don't believe it in most cases. If you go in and they pull this, start walking out and you may find a car magically appear. Lol. Dude, I get that conspiracy theorising is a popular pastime, but I'll give you a really pragmatic reason why that cannot be the case. There's 50 or 60 different car brands, depending on how you carve them up globally, like certainly the most important ones could be encapsulated in a list 50 or 60 long, okay? And they all hate each other. There's nothing 
Mercedes-Benz hates more than Volkswagen. And there's nothing Toyota hates more than Mazda. And there's nothing more that Mazda hates than Hyundai Kia, for example, right? There's so much multilateral hatred that these people could not all sit down in a room and engage in a massive global conspiracy where they all kept pumping out cars in secret during a pandemic and faked a shortage with cars just stacking up 10 high at the dock, right? And then when you walk in and call their bluff, they can magic one up. Like, come on, dude. That is unrealistic on so many levels, all right? And also, inconveniently, the car industry just wants to sell more. Mass production is a game where you get that factory, ideally, cranking out three shifts a day as fast as it can crank, just making cars endlessly because that makes the production line efficient. It lowers the per unit cost thanks to economies of scale. And then you've got these rabid sales directors who just get out the whip and they lash, right? There's a cascade of ass kicking to sell, right? That's how the car industry works. And for them to engage in an artificial inversion of this process, which is just philosophically abhorrent to them at every level is just flat out ridiculous. It's there with flat earthing and anti-vaxxing, frankly. Please tell me why I need to get rid of the mill scale on my rolled steel. Yeah, that's fair enough. Thanks for the question, Paul. I appreciate that. Did this report the other day on metallurgy and abrasives, like which different abrasives go with which kind of metallurgical applications. And if you'd like to check that out, it's just up there, dude. Now, mill scale is this black shiny crap on the outside typically of every piece of hot rolled steel you ever buy. And it's inconvenient because it's glassy and it's hard, it's hard to cut. It's really hell on uh, machine cutters, like things like uh, milling face cutters. If you just got to take a shave off uh, something that's been hot rolled, that's a pain in the ass. It's kind of hard to drill through as well and it's responsible for a fair bit of wear and tear on drills. So getting rid of it makes sense from time to time. It's also kind of flaky. So cosmetically, if you paint it, it's going to look rough. and it's porous, at least the junction between the mill scale and the bare metal and the rust is porous, and that allows water and oxygen to combine and foment more rust, which you probably don't want in the finished product. And then, like obviously, if you're going to do anything involving elbow grease, like filing or cutting with a hacksaw or anything of that nature, or you're going to run a milling face cutter over the top of a piece of hot rolled bar or rod or something, this stuff is, it's just the scale and it's really hard on the cutting edges. And that means you're gonna have more wear and tear on everything that you try and cut, sand, whatever this stuff with. It also loads up some adhesives like zirconium, all right? So you don't want that. And if you're doing what I'm doing here, which is I've got these two 250 wide pieces of steel channel and I'm turning them into a fabrication surface which is a surface that's flat in two directions and which I can clamp to and weld to. If you want to attach the ground cable for your welder, it doesn't really conduct that well so you lose a fair bit of energy through the mill scale. It's harder to get a solid electrical contact there. And then when you are welding, in particular if you're TIG welding, like that tungsten inert gas kind of welding, it's entirely intolerant of impurities such as mill scale. It hates that shit and your TIG welds look crap. And also if you're doing what most people call MIG welding, which is really metal, like gas shielded arc welding, metal inert gas, but the, the gas shielded kind of MIG welding, it's reasonably intolerant of impurities like mill scale as well. So you'd want to get rid of it for that. And even the other two kinds of welding, like flux cord arc welding, which would be MIG without the gas, if you want to think of it like that. And also just regular stick welding, like manual metal arc welding. You always get a better result if you don't have impurities to weld over, through, across, within, whatever. So for all these reasons, you want to piss mill scale off. And obviously, if you've got a manageable piece like this, 
don't bother grinding it off at all. Just go out to the local the hard, the hardware store or the local uh, supermarket even. Get yourself some vinegar, just normal white vinegar. Immerse this in white vinegar for 24 hours and then just scrub away with a normal scrubbing brush and the mill scale will be a memory. And of course, if you go to the hardware store, you can get stronger acid than that, like muriatic acid. But if you do that, you have to be pretty careful with it because it is possible to hurt yourself with that. The vapors suck. And also if you splash it into your eyes or something or just get it on your hands, that's bad news as well. But vinegar, very safe, easy to deal with. Mill scales are bastard. You kind of have to deal with it if you're going to deal with any kind of subsequent fabrication operation. I'm a blacksmith farrier and we end up with a ton of scale on a horseshoe. At farrier competitions we are forced to be Luddites and use a hot rasp, but in the field we'll use either a linisher or an angle grinder. We generally use Zerk, but going to have a bit of a play with some of the others. Hashtag respect, dude. Like, when I was training to be an engineer for the first few years, they shoved us into the workshops in heavy industry and the railways, and I always wanted to work in the blacksmith shop at Redfin there. It was just awesome. Every time I walked through it, I wanted to have a crack and I never got the chance. So, half your luck, dude, doing that sort of work. Now, zirconium is really short for zirconium oxide. They call it zirconia or just zirk. It's this bluey green stuff on this belt here for the linisha, right? It's a particular kind of oxide and it's got some interesting properties, like it self-sharpens and that's why it lasts a little bit longer than the brown stuff, which is aluminium oxide. Unfortunately though, and I was having a crack with a Zerk flap wheel the other day on a piece of metal with just a little bit of mill scale on it and have a look at that. I don't know how well you can see that. I'll try and get a bit of reflection happening for you there. But you see how loaded up that wheel is? That load up only took, you know, a couple of minutes of operation and the wheel is now next to useless. So zirconia is not the ideal abrasive to use for anything with mill scale on it. From your recent blacksmithing or from your steel merchant when you're buying the hot roll stuff, right? You're much better off going with aluminium oxide or even silicon carbide. I've worked as a metal fabricator most of my working life and never considered using a masonry grinding disc for mill scale. I'll certainly be giving it a go in future. Thanks very much, Tony. Look, I urge you to have a crack with silicon carbide because it is much more effective, especially if you've got a lot of mill scale to deal with in the one project. Brown aluminium oxide, the greeny blue zirconia, and the red ceramic, not so effective with mill scale, but silicon carbide, really good, because the abrasive dynamics are just different. It's like having a million really sharp knives having a crack at the problem. And the pro tip here, okay, is silicon carbide is common with masonry grinding wheels, and they work just fine on mill scale. But when you start with your silicon carbide wheel, here's your masonry grinding wheel, brand new, I don't know how well you can see that, but there's a really sharp 90 degree edge on the brand new wheel, obviously, because what do you expect? It's brand new. What you really want for dealing with mill scale is a used edge like this one here. You can see that radius that's been worn on the edge of the wheel. I use this on both of these beams that I'm working on here on the fabrication surface, right? And what you get is this nice rounded surface when you get a new wheel and you attack the mill scale with it, it's really savage on the underlying steel. So my strong advice would be go and find a bit of old concrete, probably not the local cop shop steps or something, and just round the wheel over until you get this sort of profile. And when you've got that, it's just right for dealing with mill scale because my process for mill scale, when I've got to get into it with silicon carbide, when you've got 1.7 meters of beam that's not amenable to being placed in a bucket and soaked in you know vinegar overnight then it's just do it with this deal with the mill scale go light with the grinder just get rid of the mill scale and then clean up the underlying steel with a 40 grit zerk flat wheel like this baby here and if you do both of those processes together you know you've got your silicon carbide first and then you've got your zerk um, dressing wheel, 40 grit's fine for most sort of, you know, ghetto engineering applications, depending on whether you're going to paint it or it's a piece of fine art or something. But 40 grit works well. 
And what I'd suggest is the other thing about silicon carbide is that I think there's some evidence that breathing this stuff is really bad for you. Silicon carbide is not one of those things that I would want to have lungs full of because the phrase million microscopic knives <laughs> might, you might give it away just ever so slightly. So if I'm grinding with this, okay, what I do is I go outside and I try and do it on a day where there's some ambient breeze. I try and stand upright, uh, up, sorry, I try and stand upright most of the time sometimes unsuccessfully, I generally try and stand upwind of the grinder, right? And I wear a full face visor and a P2 mask. And hopefully that keeps me reasonably insulated from whatever evil nature these particles in silicon carbide actually do have. So that's just a pro tip to remember when you experiment with silicon carbide on mill scale, I wouldn't do it in a closed up shed with no breathing protection. I think that's a little bit risque. As an engineer, I imagine you'd know that there's no such grade as mild steel. A Cert 4 teacher I once had advised our class never to use that term in an exam because it's not listed in any standards and you'll lose marks if you do. I'm guessing you use the term to describe low carbon steel. Yeah, dude, I agree. There's no such thing in terms of detailed design as mild steel. But context is everything, right? So if you're at TAFE or you're at university and you're doing a project that involves the design of a beam to hold a bridge up over the river and stop people from crashing to their death below, and you tell the examiner that you're going to build it out of mild steel, then you should expect to fail. But there's a category of steel that I would colloquially refer to as mild steel, and it would be these kinds of shapes here, like these big channels and these two big beams that are holding the fat cave up over my head right now. And I generally refer to them as structural grade mild steel, which would be a minimum sort of yield stress of 250 megapascals, right? And if you want to know what a megapascal is, it's one newton of force for every square millimetre of area, right? So let's think about it like that. 250 megapascals would be 250 newtons of force for one square millimetre of area, which would be roughly 25 kilos of force for every square millimetre, before it yields, which means before the deformation under load becomes permanent, okay? And mild steel, I guess, you could broadly categorise it as being anything up to about 450 MPA sort of thing. As for other kinds of steel, there's all kinds of colloquialisms for steel. There's tool steel, which uh, something like, for example, a cold chisel might be made out of. And there's high speed steel, which something like, for example, a twist drill might be made out of. And there are many different grades of those things as well. But you do tend to get these low carbon mild steels and then these tougher steels like tool steel and then even tougher steels like high speed steel. And the more you drill down into it, the more nuance there is, right? And even with cars, they use different grades of steel in the body shells of cars now. The gold standard for high strength is so-called gigapascal steel, which is 1,000 megapascals. And every time you go to a marketing presentation for the launch of a new car, they talk about how much hot forming they're doing on the bodies. This is essentially because these tougher steels in that gigapascal range are less amenable to being cold formed. And therefore, to use them, you have to heat them up and get them into shape and then let them cool down and then weld them into the body structure at typically high stress points. So I guess the terminology depends on who you're conversing with. Because when I'm talking about these beams here for fabrication, to me, they're just made out of mild steel. And we're never going to get close to the yield stress of any of that. And I know what shit they're made out of. And hopefully now, so do you. If colour makes no difference, why do they always tell you to paint the inside of rolled plastic pipe water heaters black? Pablo there. Thanks for the question, dude. Now look, I did not say in my recent report, which I will link up there, 
related to photovoltaics and our little side trip to colour doesn't make any difference when it's black car versus white car in the sun in the middle of summer. It makes a slight difference is what I claimed, like one or two percent absolute temperature. But really the difference of colour in terms of how hot a car gets inside is grossly overstated by most people. And it's just people who don't understand the relationship between radiation and thermal effects. It's, that's just how it is, okay? Now, when you're talking about a heater up there on the roof, one of those cheapies that's really just black polyethylene pipe sitting in the sun, I'd suggest that the colour of the pipe doesn't make all that much difference either. But what would make a pretty big difference is its reflectivity. So... It might be a good idea to, if it's shiny at all, just to knock it back a little bit with some 400 grit wet and dry, something like that, because the more you can knock back the reflectivity, the more radiation is going to be absorbed by the material. Okay, so I'd suggest that one of those matte coloured cars might be a whole bunch hotter than a shiny glossy car, irrespective of the colour. That'd be an interesting experiment to run. Anyway, the other thing about heaters on the roof, those kinds of heaters on the roof, the ones that absorb solar radiation into the tubes and heat up the water, what I'd suggest there is one of the principal means of heat loss there in the roof heater is forced convection. Like when the wind blows, it's likely to take a whole bunch of heat away from the heater. So a way of making that installation more thermally efficient would be to put it in a box that keeps the wind away and cover it with a highly transparent sheet of glass that was also, you know, tough enough to withstand things hitting it in the environment. And look, if you want another example of how colour really doesn't matter, you know those nutbags who say, I'm going to paint my intercooler black and improve its thermal efficiency, get more cooling out of it. <sighs> Dude, that's not going to work. Don't worry about it. And the differential diagnosis, the evidence for this is when you go and look at every car that's manufactured today statistically, just go and have a look at the pointy end, right, and look through the grill. And what you will see there is typically two or three heat exchangers. You'll see a condenser for the HVAC, like the air conditioner, and that's to reject heat during the condensation phase when the working fluid turns from a gas into a liquid, right? And then you'll see a heat exchanger for the engine coolant, like the radiator, even though that's such a dodgy word because they don't really radiate. And you might even see an intercooler, which is typically an air-to-air -air type cooler for the inlet air charge because going through a turbocharger typically heats it up a lot. Okay, those three heat exchangers are aluminium. They're like bare aluminium. And if the car industry could save just this much aluminium on each car, right, by painting those uh, heat exchangers black, then they would do that in a heartbeat because, you know, 10 grams here and 10 grams here and 10 grams there from three different heat exchangers is 30 grams times 1 million cars is... 30 million grams, which is 30,000 kilograms. It's like 30 tonnes of aluminium saved right there, isn't it? Not an insubstantial saving. The reason they're not black is because black won't help. It's partly because those devices, those heat exchangers, they lose their heat. They reject heat into the environment by forced convection, which is agnostic when it comes to colour. These things do not radiate at all, not substantially. They lose heat by convection. Therefore, painting them will not help. It can only hurt because the paint will be effectively a layer of insulation between the heat exchanger and the air, which is the fluid that the heat is trying to convect itself away into. So however you look at this, colour is kind of irrelevant. You've got to send this video to Rob Stokes, the New South Wales planning minister. He and his boffins have decided to ban dark coloured roofs in Sydney as they state they contribute to heating up the planet and contribute to climate change. I kid you not. Seriously, who advises these people? Interesting observation there from Far Ken. Imagine that. Far Ken. Parents, obviously, not really big thinkers, I think it's fair to say. Now, Rob Stokes, 
Rob Stokes' first effort at abject comedy was found in his comments recently on electric vehicles, reported here. Now, his quaint hypothesis on electric vehicles was just another kind of enslavement. I'm paraphrasing, although I think he did use that word, enslavement, right? Just like internal combustion, only a different slave master, okay? So far out of touch with reality, it's not funny. Particularly galling in the case of somebody who's a planning minister, like responsible for planning and urban spaces for five million people here in New South Shitsville. Unacceptably so, in my view. So I had a little bit of a look at Mr Stokes. Mr Stokes is just what we need in politics. <coughs> they can agree. He's a lawyer with a diploma in biblical studies. So who better qualified to do all of that planning decision making? And when it comes to black and white roofs, if Mr Stokes believes that this kind of thing has any hope of making any tangible difference whatsoever to climate change or quality of urban whatever in our cities, he's off with the fairies and out of touch with the physics again. I didn't catch the IP rating of this thing if you mentioned it, and how would it stand up strapped in the back of a ute on the way to Dingo Piss Creek with Tiffany? Keep up the good work. That question from Brambo Kef. You just know he can fight, don't you? Brambo Kef. Conversation stops when Brambo Kef is announced <laughs> at dinner parties, I'm sure. Anywho, I did this report recently on this baby, which is the Bluetti AC200P. It's essentially a 2000 watt hour lithium ion battery with an inverter packaged up inside the box. Numerous outputs, you've got wireless, phone charging, you've got your 240 over here, you've got your 12 volt, you've got your USB-A out, and you've got your USB-C out. So you can use all of these outputs simultaneously, subject to not overloading the maximum discharge capacity of the battery. So that's really nice, and I'll put a link somewhere up there if you'd care to check that out. And there'll also be links in the description if you want to see the product online. So check that out by all means. But in relation to the IP rating, like IPX, waterproof environment, proofing and all of that stuff, it's quite open. Like there's a fan inlet or outlet there and it's analog over the other side. So you've got flow through ventilation here, presumably through the inverter. And I suspect the whole battery charging and discharging thing has a big fat heat sink on it as well. Uh, when I look in the manual, there's no IP rating for this device. And in fact, the official advice in the manual is keep it out of the rain and don't use it in high humidity over 90%. So I don't know what the IPX rating for don't get it wet is, but dude, don't get it wet. And it's a sensitive sort of electronic device. It's been ruggedized for use outdoors, obviously, but it's probably not compatible with Operation Desert Storm. And I guess it just depends how roughly Tiffany wants to play with the thing, so to speak, en route. Hi, John. Can you please confirm that this unit has a 40 amp hour lithium battery? Thanks. Bob the Colorado there. Yes, he sounds like a real man too, doesn't he? Anyway, I've done another report and I'll link to that up there now. So this is about how it's kind of farcical, or at least it doesn't make rational sense to use amp hours when you're comparing batteries at different voltages. The only thing that matters is watt hours because watt hours are the amount of onboard energy. So this is a 2000 watt hour battery and if you're running it exclusively at 240 volts, that means it's about 8.5 amp hours, okay? If you're outputting 12 volts, it's about 167 amp hours. And of course, these ratings, amp hours and watt hours and things like that, they're subject to the discharge limitations of the battery and the maximum draw rates and things of that nature. So there's not infinite linearity of uh, 2,000 watt hours. You can't have... 4,000 watts for 30 minutes, for example, because that will trip the overload protection inside the device. You just can't draw it that fast. And with these kinds of batteries, 
you get to a certain level and there might still hypothetically be some energy inside them. It's just really locked away and not accessible. But generally, I just go with the manufacturer's claims because I don't really have a means of testing what amount of energy remains inside the battery. And hey, mechanical engineer, not electrical. Mr. Synakism. It's uncanny how you mention that right now, Butch, because I happen to be... Uh, say nakeel from the waist down as we speak. And I have been accused previously in my life many times of being far too synacheal for my own good. More than this, however, I think the most pertinent point to be made is that it is a great tragedy when a child is left standing on the platform and the education train has just sort of chuffed off. Made to run hot to beat omission laws. Quite right, Marvin, those omission laws notoriously tough to comply with. On a positive note, however, at least the kiddies left standing on the platform will have company for those six long years that all of their friends remain in the classroom. Dose Schrodinger's cat still shit out microchips for the automobile industry in the profit kitty litter box. Astute question Jeff, timely, and one which I have never been asked before. Go figure. Dose shredding as cat poop microchips or dose he not. One of the big quantum theoretical questions. Yes and no, best answer. You can investigate it, of course, but when you open the box and look, the waveform collapses and suddenly you're standing in Copenhagen. How the hell do you reach the blue sorting boxes? Bugged me the entire video. Thank you so much, William. I am overjoyed to learn this, of course. Dude, any day I can bug the crap out of someone for an entire video, good day in the office for me. How do you get to those blue storage bins on the wall? This was such a thing in the comments. I have no idea why, right? Look, the way I do it is I make like friggin' Iron Man or Luke or something, and I just hover whenever I need anything out of the blue boxes, right? And on the odd occasion where that doesn't work, I just uh, use that step ladder there. Now, the reason for having the boxes up high, which is kind of why I'm fielding these questions, is let's talk about workshop design just for a moment, shall we? The thing about workshops is accessibility of the things you need and like primary secondary tertiary accessibility all of the things that i need all the time like a dead blow hammer or a center punch or a ball peen hammer something of that nature some screwdrivers the pliers whatever a file that's all got to be primarily accessible the most common power tools, you know, a drill, a driver, an angle grinder, things of that nature. They've all got to just be grab it, get going, okay? And then there's like secondary accessibility, which is like the blue boxes just up here, okay? I don't always need an M12 by 50 socket head cap screw, but it is just up there if I need it. And all I've got to do is get ladder boy off the wall and stick it up there and grab what I need. And then when I need stuff that I don't use all of the time, it can be packed away all over the place in various toolboxes and everything's got a place and the things that I use least often are the least accessible and the things that I use the most often are the most accessible, like all of those tools hanging up there. And I've got these other stations over here where I'm going to make uh, sort of modular platforms where I can have grinder, vice, bending jig, things of those natures, and they can be interchangeable, so I can reconfigure. I'm also going to have those modular stations on the ends of the fabrication surface, just so that I can tweak it, so that it's however I need it to be for the job at hand. And one of the other things about having all the primary stuff up on the wall and accessible now is you can see if something's missing and you don't lose 10 minutes here, five minutes there, 15 minutes there, an hour and a half over here, 
failing to find something that you think might be in the bottom of one of several dozen frigging toolboxes because I've spent so much of my life doing that. It's so hateful and so inefficient and so frigging wasteful of one's only remaining resource, which is time, that wouldn't it be a good idea if you configured your own fat cave, this is a piece of free advice, just configure your own fat cave so that most of the stuff that you need all of the time is visually apparent. Then you can get it quick and you know if something's missing. Thanks very much for watching. I'll check you later.